My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. Some of the people coming up are Dan Burkholder, Tony Lovejoy, Peter Crow, Brigitte Maddox, and Jeff Shiwi. You can also find links to previous conversations there. Today, my guest is Stephen Johnson. For most of you, Stephen needs no introduction. He's a pioneer in digital imaging, involved as a photographer, a consultant, and instructor. I remember some of Steve's early work with 4x5 digital backs around 20 years ago when we first met. Um, and getting ready for this conversation, Steve told me that he's not interested in trying to enhance what he sees, but he's entranced by the word wonder, the vision, and the truth of the experience. So please welcome Stephen Johnson. Hey, John. Great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, so how are things going for you? How's Pacifica? Uh, Pacifica is fine. It's uh, <laughs> nice to be so close to the ocean and I get these varying views every day and it's uh, giving me a lot of reason to be grateful for the natural world that I live in amongst and close enough to San Francisco that I can start a whole new project during the pandemic on Golden <laughs> Gate Park. So uh, 10 miles away from that and uh, literally about a minute and a half from the beach. It's not a bad situation. Yeah, so you're in your educational center there in Pacifica, right? Yeah, I'm in the main gallery today. I decided I, that showing the gallery at least gives it some reason for being at this point in time. <laughs> yeah, I guess you don't have many people visiting you right now. <laughs> no, I, you know, technically I probably shouldn't let anybody in, but legally I can let people in in very small numbers and for my own safety and theirs. They have to be masked and I won't let more than two in at a time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve, did you, people, did you get rid of your other place? I've had this place since 2004, Mark. What, what about the, didn't you have another place? From 99 uh, to 2004, I did, yeah. That one's long gone. This oh, is really? 4,000 square <laughs> feet. So. so as I mentioned in the beginning, you used to work with the four by five scanning back. You were doing these interesting uh, landscapes where a Harris shutter effect to them. Are you still working large format? Not the last few years. I get out the, it was built by Michael Collette. It was a scanning back that could go into a four by five and battery powered and laptop controlled. That's what gave birth to the whole project on the national parks that I called with a new eye because it was such stunning resolution, detail and dynamic range that literally the project jumped into my head because it was such a revolutionary view. And that was, I first saw a prototype of the camera in September of 93 and started going out with Michael in uh, January of uh, two, uh, 1994 uh, when the camera was finished. And by, oh, by the time, I, John, I did that Photoshop conference in 95, I was well into the project, the one in New York, uh, yeah. where I talked about imaging ethics and the digital age. You may remember <laughs> that talk. Uh, and, um, it's, uh, it's not what I use these days, but mm -hmm. I keep it all working and tuned up so I can. I'm half as tempted to go out with the four by five with sheet film as I am to do that at this point, just because I wanna keep things mixed up and stirred up. That's great, that's great. Um, let's see, you also mentioned something at some point about using a camera as a scanner. Yeah, yeah, more and more these days, instead of uh, turning on the Emicon Hasselblad scanner, uh, I'm photographing the uh, negatives or slot on a light table or a light, actually an old slide illuminator uh, mm -hmm. from Bessler and uh, providing an alternative light source for it and just photographing them directly onto my Canon 5DSR. So it gives me an instant 50 megapixel capture, which is not bad. Yeah. And if, if it's something that I need to be real serious about, I'll go ahead and get out the film or <laughs> the film may well be right in front of me. <laughs> Uh, put it in the in the film scanner. But for most things that I need, uh, it's given me a grain sharp image, mm -hmm. even though for black and white, of course, it's going through the Bayer pattern, which is unfortunate that I don't have a black and white 50 megapixel camera I can do that mm -hmm. with, but one could. And uh, so it's, it's actually a very uh, quick way of digitizing a lot of work, not as quick as a proof sheet that you might uh, scan on a flatbed and then break up mm -hmm. into little individual images. But um, it's been a real boon, especially for a lot of old family photographs uh, where I had slides right. uh, or old negatives that I can even color negatives from the 50s of my 
my mom who never threw away anything, but um, <laughs> gave me all of her negatives at one point. And so I've, I've got those, even though they present a color balance issue, I, I do have them. And yeah. You're that's... lucky. I think my mom lost most of my stuff from college and the like sometime when I, over the years. Uh, well, well, I was worried about that. So I did ask her at one point, can I just have all these negatives? And yeah. <laughs> So I, I do have her photo albums with photos, black and white photos from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So I can go and take some photos of those. So You know, it's been really interesting reassembling the old rolls of film that were cut and put in, in paper mm -hmm. and then putting them back together in a polyethylene sleeve. And I discovered photographs that I didn't know were there, including a rather haunting double exposure that was in a camera that I'd never seen a print of that is uh, one of the few family portraits that was ever made. And so it's nice. interesting. So what's inspiring you these days? <laughs> Staying alive. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's the same things that have always inspired me. It's just a more constricted geography. Uh, like I said before, I'm, I'm fortunate to be so close to so many things I love. Um, but certainly the restriction of feeling free to travel is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But the inspiration still comes from the light and expanse and wonder of the natural world. And yeah. even if it's something as simple as going, as I was saying before we started the talk, going out at sunset and photographing from the cliffs, it's, it's a really, really nice thing to stay engaged in the natural world. And I have a deck right out on my front porch that uh, lets me go out and just be surrounded by the stars as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just coming in the other, uh, just checking it out the other night, a little past the full moon, and there were these stripes of clouds coming out at me at this big fan as the moon was rising behind some eucalyptus trees. I was out there for an hour just making new photographs. Nice. And, uh, nice. you know, in some cases you get with long exposures and you go get the tripod and you lower you know, the ISO and you just cope with the situation. But the fact is the the wonder of photography is still part of what is sustaining me without any doubt at all. And that's, that's part of what I care so deeply about trying to make sure people are able to stay connected to the seduction that making images actually is. And um, for me, that wonder, r regardless of the fact I photograph everything I see, and it doesn't really matter what the subject <laughs> is, um, that wonder of that engagement in the natural world is still at the heart of why I photograph and where my heart is beats the most soundly. Very nice. Um, so why don't we show some images well, for people who may not be totally familiar with your work? Well, we'll probably have to stop this before I get too far deep into it. It's so <laughs> damn, I wasn't able to pare down the, uh, the slideshow quite as well as I should have. So let's see here. You should see the photographic projects page. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that sort of goes through how the career has gone. None of these were really planned. They all just sort of happened. And uh, in a sense, the work I've been doing on Golden Gate Park since May has been the most planned in that I've been thinking about it and toying with doing it for more than 15 years. But the proximity and uh, the pandemic have sort of made it a really good subject mm -hmm. to concentrate on. So it's, it's you know, the, the projects are drawn from some sort of impulse. The Mona Lake work was drawn from understanding that it was being threatened by water diversions to Los Angeles and feeling a need to try and do something about it. The Central Valley project was largely about going home to the San Joaquin Sacramento Valley and trying to understand where I came from. The Parks Project came directly out of Michael Collette's Better Light Scanning back and just the absolute wonder of what photographs could be in terms of technical quality. And um, knowing that the National Parks had played such a, a, a direct, the photography had played such a direct role in the uh, establishment of the National Parks. Exquisite Earth came from in 2009 and 10, starting to look back at the work I'd been doing on some of these trips I'd gotten to go on during that period of time. And it just became a study in the wonder of the earth. Life form came about um, because I was looking to, um, I had to speak at a dear friend's funeral and I was looking for a completely opposite experience. And I went to a local orchid nursery that morning to sort of feed that better positive uh, feeling. 
and it became this seduction into the form that life can take in uh, plants. And um, like I said, Golden Gate Park came out of an invitation from my friend Holly to go look at uh, the baby herons in Stow Lake and Golden Gate Park. And pretty soon I was hooked on getting back into the park. And now it's this year long project. So let's see, I've got Good. some photographs. So okay. going back to the very early work, this is 1977 with the first experiments with the zone system in Yosemite. Getting to know the California coast, this is Stage Road, uh, not too far from uh, Pescadero, San Gregorio. The late 80s, Denali. In the late 70s, getting seduced by Monk, which is at the same time as I quit photographing with color slide film and moved to color negative and suddenly I had control over color like I'd never had before. And a real big shift in my perception took place where I was starting to notice pastel color like I had never noticed it before and in a medium that could actually record it. So my color work at Mona Lake was really the birth of a lifelong style of appreciation for subtle color. But I've what always remained, go ahead. Now what format were you shooting here? Uh, most of this is two and a quarter or four by five. Okay. It's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've always remained interested in black and white. I've never lost my love of uh, black and white photography while simultaneously loving what I could do with color. Uh, then after the Mona Lake exhibit uh, went all over the country and sort of got the book done on that, uh, my friend Bob Dawson and I decided to go back to our homeland and photograph the Central Valley. And so it became a whole uh, five year long photographic project and another five years to do the book. So it was a pretty big deal. And it was a complete blend of black and white and color. That's right downtown Sacramento. This is out in the Sacramento San Joaquin uh, Delta. This is a farmer that got lost in Kern County and was never seen again. <laughs> So uh, excuse me for having both too many and too few from a particular project. I got, to, I got, I got around to editing the first few down and then I lost uh, faith with uh, really trimming it down. When Michael Collette invented this scanning back um, and I decided to do this project on the national parks, we called a press conference in Yosemite at the Ansel Adams Gallery and we had about, about 40 people come up for the press conference. And um, realized about a week before I'd never made a single photograph in Yosemite with the camera. So I went up to photograph and which was a good idea. Uh, but this is a photograph that was actually made of Yosemite Falls during the press conference. And in this case, it was an infrared. One of the nice things about the scanning back is when Michael Collette designed it, he didn't put an IR cutoff filter on the sensor itself. And so if I wanted infrared, I just didn't put the IR cutoff filter on the lens. If I wanted normal color, I put it on the lens and got normal color. Yeah. And so ended up with that uh, really just capitalized on a style that had already been well underway for more than a decade. But at the same time, it's trying to recognize when the scanning backs time recording actually could do something positive rather than just fracture things. In this case, this is volcanic steam coming off of Volcano National Park, about a two and a half minute exposure that um, stretched out all those cumulus-like steam clouds. And uh, John, we were talking about friends from Thunder Lizard. Well, mm -hmm. Toby Molina uh, helped me organize a climb of the south rim of Mount St. Helens in 1995 with the scanning back. <laughs> and uh, so I was very, very pleased to get up there with the, all of the equipment. And So is that Rainier in the distance? That's Rainier at Spirit Lake, and you see the lava dome forming at the lower left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. And there's even steam being recorded, albeit somewhat fractured digital scanning back steam. But none <laughs> uh, And then at, at that point in time, I, I was starting to make prints and working with an iris print house called Digital Pond in San Francisco. And later Mac made some at Nash Editions for me as well. And then pretty soon uh, Iris sent in a big printer, so I was making my own. Um, and again, it allowed me to just further develop the, the photographic style that I already had, except with a greater degree of delicacy in the highlights and dynamic range than I'd ever had before. This is Yellowstone. And uh, fog at Acadia National Park one morning. 
And of course, when I go to the petrified forest, I don't photograph the logs, I photograph the landscape for the <laughs> most part. And uh, the lava flows and volcanoes were as interesting to me as anything else. As well, that's, well yeah, as that's really interesting. Trying to get uh, a sense of the vastness of some of the glaciers at Kenai Fjords National Park. So that project went on for more than five years. And you know, I consider it still, I can add anything to it anytime I want because for one reason or another, the book still doesn't exist other than in <laughs> prototypes. But then as I was starting to travel more and Jeff is on the line here and Jeff and I were on, went to Antarctica together for the first time in December of 2005 and um, ended up being down there four or five times over the years. And it started birthing a whole other body of work that was just a continuation of the style that became about design and sensuality and sometimes things you couldn't quite believe, uh, cop, raw copper ore that I initially thought was graffiti from the old science station that we were at, which both was humbling that I would be so human civilization oriented that I would think something so natural with something else entirely. And that moment that uh, Jeff will remember this, when we decided with no students in the Zodiac to float under this arch for a very limited number of seconds, uh, <laughs> because we knew we were risking our lives and we were yeah. risking students' lives. And a whole day at a place called Deception Island where I climbed up this hill with all of this big four by five equipment, the best photograph I made of the day was handheld with the 35 cannon of a little piece of ice next to the boat. <laughs> so, you know, you never know what you're gonna see. Yeah, I mean, it's your tools. It looks, it looks like that particular one repeats here a little higher res. And the things you see in Antarctica, there's almost no way to sum it up. I mean, there's no way to gather it together because there's so much. And in a sense, the, um, the exquisite earthwork allowed me to gather all this disparate kind of disparate places together into a single view that was really more about trying to understand the wonder of the planet as I'd been privileged to be able to see it. Yeah, if folks in the audience have questions about any of these images, feel free to ask. Yeah, I'm actually making it through the slideshow faster than I thought I would, so I'm <laughs> glad about that. Uh, then that whole project on the, the flora, life form, like I said, really came out of a desire to get away from what the day held and reacquainted me with this owner of this uh, bromeliad and orchid nursery. And pretty soon she gave me a key and I was just, making these close-ups and they sort of necessitated focus stacking and so it, it became a whole body of work that I had no idea would exist even a couple of months before it did but it's led me to other places this happens to be the U.S. Botanical Garden right next to now the fortress of the U.S. Capitol and sometimes you know I started teaching classes and uh, using the nursery as a field site and in some cases, just the, a lily I picked up at the local Safeway grocery store <laughs> it ended up being a demo for the class and I ended up liking it. Is this all of course, natural with, light? What was that? Excuse me? Is this all natural light? All but this one, it's interesting that you asked right now. Uh, this is artificially lit for the demo the night before the class started, but everything else was natural light, yes. And that's because it was at night. It was at night light it and uh, I wasn't in the nursery I was in my gallery here just doing a setup so people could see how to do the focus stacking and things like that. Of course when I decided uh, back in uh, May to go ahead and do work on the Golden Gate Park I had all these images already this is an aerial of the western part of the park and Golden Gate Bridge that was not made for the project it was made because I was always interested. And of course, anytime I can fly, I'm interested in photographing mm -hmm. around the Bay Area. And this was just one of those flights. Yeah, Hollis is asking a question. What is focus stacking for those who don't? Focus stacking is where you're trying to get more depth of field than you can inherently get by stopping down the lens. So what you end up doing is focusing a series of images ever deeper into the field of view and then using a piece of software to bring those various uh, sharp focused portions of the photograph together. And the software I'm using to do that is called Helicon Focus. So when and you do course, focus, go, focus go stack ahead. in those, as you refocus, it changes the size of the image too. So does Helicon take care of the resizing yes. and everything? Yeah, it does. And it allows nice. you a whole retouching module as well to try and correct for things that it, 
it fails to do all its own. Sure, it's and I guess that helps you get around um, diffraction too, so you don't have to shoot as far stop down. Yeah, and in many of these cases, if you had a F-256, you still couldn't get enough depth of field. <laughs> so uh, cool. well, yeah, thank you. It, 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 aver it avoids the fuzzing up of the small apertures, and at the same time allows you to get more depth of field, which is kind of interesting because in so much of my photographic career, what I've been trying to do is recreate in my single photograph my visual experience of being there. Because that's what, for the most part, I'm interested in doing is being witness to the wonder that I see. And of course, as we look around the scene, our eye is constantly refocusing mm -hmm. so that we have a sort of concatenated visual experience of almost infinite depth of field. And that's simply not the way camera optics with a single image Right, our works. brain has this permanence to the vision of what we see, so it just kind of yes. blends it all together. So I'm, I'm trying, once again, in my photographic career, I'm doing this in run around the limitations that we've traditionally had <laughs> and digital technologies allowing me to do that. So here's some of the photographs from the, from the project. Let's see, I actually want to, this is, uh, whoops, going a little too fast. These are some that I've been making from Golden Gate Park. Those tones are great. Well, the soft light that the Bay Area often gives you is just amazing. I was particularly pleased with the quality of light that came through in this one. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm not wedded to color. The black and white in the park is something that I find almost infinitely beautiful as well. And I've always loved both, as I said earlier. So there's, there's no mind jump here. It's just natural. And I've always been a sucker for rock and roll and for birds and wildlife. And so you photograph what you see. <laughs> Went up to see baby herons, but this great blue just started flying across uh, Snow Lake. And you know, when I'm not a skilled wildlife photographer, but occasionally I get uh, lucky and uh, I'm sufficiently prepared to be able to get something. Yeah, it works. <laughs> In this case, <laughs> it worked out okay. And then I'm going back to the old film. I mean, this is a good example. This is a, uh, two and a quarter exposure from the late 1970s of Golden Gate Park. And I knew I'd made these and fortunately I'm fairly well organized with my negatives. So it was not that hard to go back, grab the negative and put it underneath the Canon camera and do a quick uh, instant digitization of the negatives without having to even go to the trouble of uh, putting in the film scan. So anyway, that's just a little overview of some yeah. of the work and uh, I'll be glad to show more because I have a much more extensive slideshow <laughs> open, but I think at the moment what I should yeah, do let's is talk a little more do a more conversation. Yeah. Mode, which so what's fun. what's your feeling on? Do you oh well, I try and use the whole, I try and use the whole frame, uh -huh. but I have no uh, no hesitation to get rid of stuff where I blow it, or something just doesn't fit the aspect ratio of the frame. Mm -hmm. For me, the the image I intend is what is sacred. And if the aspect ratio works and I was able to make the, uh, the intuition of the time work within that aspect ratio, that's fine. I, I prefer that if it works out that way. But I have no hesitation to crop an image mm -hmm. if in fact I've made a mistake and sloppily included something I didn't or the aspect ratio just doesn't fit the image. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, photographing iconic locations. Uh, what's it like to go out to someplace like Yosemite? <laughs> and, you know, it's been done. It, it, yeah, well, it, it's interesting that you asked that question after I showed that photograph of Yosemite Falls, because when we did that press conference, we, we started at the gallery, Ansel Adams Gallery, and we ended up back there because we had converted Ansel's back room into a digital lab with the family being bought into it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't <laughs> commandeered or anything. Uh, and uh, so we had computers and printers and big monitors there. This was June of 94. But the initial thing was a little introductory talk and the gallery hired a video crew to come tape it, it was great. But then we walked into the meadow to photograph just to show everything. And of course, Yosemite Falls is sitting right there. So it's hard to not take a photograph of Yosemite Falls. But if you had asked me if I'd actually, would actually show a photograph of Yosemite Falls in public, oh my God, it's been done. But what ended up happening with both the infrared and the motion was something quite, unique and unexpected. And so I ended up showing the photograph. So iconic places like Yosemite are a real challenge. 
But Yosemite is really special to me. I grew up downstream on the, not too far from the Merced River in Merced, that's my hometown. And so Yosemite was the first place I ever saw deer or bear or was in a forest. So for me, it was second nature, even though there was still and is still so much to learn about it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both um, iconic and having been done and at the same time, for most of us, sacred. But for me, sacred in a very personal sense as well. Yeah. And if I think about Ansel's work and I'm in Yosemite, I'm completely unproductive. If I just look at what I'm seeing uh, and put myself in uncomfortable weather, then I'm usually uh, able to see some things that I like. <laughs> and I haven't been there for a year now, which is kind of unfortunate, but I made some photographs a year ago, brand new photographs, happened to be ice in the Merced River that I was quite happy with. Yeah. So I don't think I've ever made a trip that I didn't make some photographs um, of Yosemite that I liked. <laughs> That doesn't mean they're always unique and keep it. Sure. So Jeff Shiwi is saying, does Steve retouch his images in Photoshop? <laughs> <laughs> How nice of you to ask, Jeff. I will take dust spots off the sensor out. I will not put anything in nor take <laughs> anything out that was there. Uh, Je and of course, Jeff is asking quite purposefully. <laughs> um, I have a real ethic. If I'm going to call it a photograph, it needs to be what was in front of the camera. Otherwise, it's a constructed image and it's a different kind of use mm -hmm. of what photography can help create. And so I'm not in to photography for what I can synthesize. My love of photography and the natural world uh, sort of come right together in being as faithful as I can. And in being faithful, I am reaching toward my own heart, my own heartfelt reaction to what I see. And consequently, the truth of what I'm able to photograph, limited truth though it may be, it may be the most truthful medium we have of photograph. And there is something sacred about that. I wouldn't call it a photograph if it, it had been composited. I would just call it something else. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not valuable, it's not worthwhile. Um, it's just not for me photography. Sure, it's that's yeah. like for me as a New Yorker. There's things all around the country that's called pizza. I wish they just call it <laughs> flatbread with something on it. <laughs> well, there might be some people from Chicago that might dispute you on that. Well, that's 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 a quiche. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, J Jeff is asking the question because for years we've talked about people. Um, so-called doctoring the image or now the the most common word you hear and for a long time is enhance <laughs> well you know when you think about that does the world need enhancing i mean my gosh it's already quite mm -hmm. self-embellished thank you and it's quite a task just to record what's in front of your eye <laughs> it doesn't need embellishment now that doesn't mean that ultimately some aspects of tonality and mm -hmm. color that the, the camera managed to record don't need some work. It doesn't mean I'm gonna see as powerfully as I wish I did. It doesn't mean that color casts that the digital camera might pick up from different light sources that is different than what my eyes saw doesn't need to be adjusted to try and get it more toward what my eyes saw. Mm -hmm. But that's always full. And uh, I, I can surely never say I always rise to the occasion to um, record faithfully what I saw, but that is the attempt. That's why I got interested in color management in 1996 and 97, because it allowed me to not only control the print, but the appearance on the screen, which was very mm -hmm. important to me. So yeah. the answer to the question is if I do something other than a straight photograph, I just tell people what it is right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And this came up just this week because um, there was a moon rising over the, the national park above my house as I was driving home. And I got this photograph that I really liked of the moon right next to a tree and with the 600 millimeter lens on the new Canon 600. I was literally able to hand hold this photograph. I almost feel lazy, but I remember that <laughs> I did it. Be, well, I was afraid that the moon would move too much by the time I got the tripod set up. And so I, I got a photograph in black and white that I was quite happy with, but I kept going back to some of the color variants on it. And I, I, I kept going to this one where there's sort of a nook between the hill. You know, I, I went back and forth left and right till it was sitting right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the color 
version and then I created a black and white version and both of them had things I really loved about them. But for some reason, a 50% imposition of the uh, black and white created this kind of faded color look. And I said, well, I like that. I don't care in this case, if it's not real, I'm just gonna tell people what I did. And yeah, so I went and posted that on Facebook and said, said exactly that. I liked both the 50% fade of the black and white was appropriate. <laughs> Now, when, when you think about black and white photography, of course, that is not faithful to what we see at all. It is a complete uh, departure from human visual experience. And so this was sort of halfway down that path. <laughs> and uh, it's my color that I feel like I need to be realistic with because it becomes a representation so mm -hmm. much more of what I saw. But that doesn't mean I would feel any differently about cloning stuff out or cloning stuff in in black and white. It's just a different set of circumstances sure. with regards well, to realism that isn't John there. and yeah. Steve. The reason I ask is, is there has been quite the controversy last year in 2020, landscape photographer of the year. Um, the winning entries were all heavily, heavily manipulated. Some of them were multi-image combinations. Some of them were impossible renderings uh, mm -hmm. that you know, Stephen and I and people that are used to photographing nature look at and say, well, that's not real. Mm -hmm. And it kind of right. denigrates the real uh, photography. And exactly. it's kind of an Instagram or Snapseed uh, mentality on what constitutes a good image. And one of the reasons that I like Steve is that uh, uh, it's pretty much unadulterated. You see what he saw, or at least you see what he thinks he saw. <laughs> yeah, great. well, the, uh, I'll have to cop to that. I Hopefully my vision will remain pretty good so that mm -hmm. it's going to be reasonably faithful. And of course, with um, a good camera profile and occasionally the uh, color checker card and other sorts of reassurances when the color is a little strange. Yeah, I, so also, I also remain, and of course, I'm cognizant of this, this as I get older. I remain a very good judge of color balance. I can see the tiniest variations in things when they're not right. And by right, of course, I'm alluding back to what I saw. I can see color casts and things that um, tend to amaze other people and say, I just don't see it. <laughs> and then when I do the before and after, then they can see it. Yeah. But that color perception, I hope it's a gift I continue to, to, to have as my eyes age about that but uh it is something that i treasure too because if i'm seeing a nuance of the slightest color cast in something in the real world i take kind of a mental note of that and i'm looking for the bare raw processing to do a custom raw processing i almost never take the uh, point of departure de facto interpretation of a raw processing of any image in fact i've rebuilt all of my uh, starting points for every camera to lower the contrast, not the contrast, to open up the shadows, close mm -hmm. down the highlights, get a more realistic contrast of what's actually in front of the camera. And for that, I feel blessed. Yep. Uh, for me, when, when we finally got, uh, thank you, Eric Chan, for working so hard on getting the uh, uh, Adobe Camera Raw and then its integration into Lightroom with the highlight shadow white black sliders because that became a real imperative for me to be able to assert more tonal control over that raw interpretation. And, uh, and he did a good job with it. And I use that all the time. And in a yeah, sense- Eric's one of the I've, Photoshop engineers. Yes, yeah. And uh, part of the camera raw team. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all here at one point in this very room. It was a great afternoon. <laughs> uh, that in a sense becomes a tool for the most realistic photography uh, that I've really ever had other than the better light camera. And so in that sense, having the ability to really control the depth of shadows and blacks and whites and highlights, in addition to the mid-tone exposure slider, mm -hmm. really gives me an ability to look at things and try and um, tune them in to what I saw. And of course it really helps if I'm looking at those images the same day I made them. So I try and make a habit of offloading files in the evening and doing some preliminary raw interpretations uh, to get the images in the neighborhood of what's still very fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I intend to be that way too. Well, I know other people say they like to have a little time between, but I, I want to jump in there with my memory fresh. Well, for my agenda, I really need to for that fresh mm -hmm. memory. Yeah. Um, you so know, the other thing I wanted to say and to sort of react to what Jeff was saying, my entire photographic career has been dedicated toward, uh, has been interested in landscape photography, but my political involvements came before my photography. And that was not... <laughs> That was not just working against the war and for losing candidate after losing candidate. It was also the conservation movement. We started an environmental group when I was a sophomore in high school. So photography and conservation was something I was gradually become aware of as I was getting interested in photography. And let's face it, if you're going to use landscape photography as a conservation tool, an enhanced photograph is essentially useless because mm -hmm. you're creating a false world. It's, it's like you're using an Albert Bierstadt painting to represent Yosemite rather than a Carlton Watkins photograph. And for me, the Carlton Watkins photograph, despite the romance of Bierstadt, the Watkins photograph is, is more substantial to me. And it became obviously a great tool for conservation, mm -hmm. both to the US Congress in 1864 and Abraham Lincoln. So if photography, is a tool of the preservation of the landscape that you're photographing. Enhancement is almost the antithesis of what you really uh, ought to be trying to do, in my opinion. So I guess you'll disagree with Kevin Raber saying that content aware is your friend. Well, content aware <laughs> is, uh, you could also saw cognizance of fabrication. So, you know, you <laughs> so David Plermo was, yeah, David Plermo was asking where your NASA prints came to be or how they came to be. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. You're, you're, how did your space NASA prints come to be? Oh, the whole 50 years of space photography exhibit I did in uh, 2019. <laughs> Is that what you're asking about, David? Yeah. Um, yes. Well, as, as the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing was coming around, it was sort of um, irresistible for Steve the Curious, <laughs> insatiably curious, to go back to all these uh, photographs I had been saving for all these years from digging through the NASA PR archives in Washington, DC to uh, having a chance to go to uh, the Kennedy Space Center and watch a launch of the shuttle and get tours and see a break, you know, the shuttle up on a jack getting a break job to being able to look at the cut up uh, Saturn V gantry and walk on the steps before it all got scrapped that and that 12 year old star trek kid that is still very much alive <laughs> in me uh, so over the years i'd had a great privilege to get to go to the kennedy space center for example a fellow walked into a lecture probably in la um, that was head of the cassini project uh, the probe to saturn and invited me down to the jet propulsion laboratory to do a lecture so I had all these sort of space things floating in my mind and I've been gathering all these images for years. And I just decided because I've got this nice big Canon printer that will self load roll paper. So it makes it so easy to go from sheet tests to roll prints, the Canon 4000 in that case. I said, you know, Canon's gonna supply all the luster paper and ink I need as part of my Explorer of Light contract. All it takes is my time. And so I went back to some of the images I already been downloading of Hubble, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and Apollo. And pretty soon I was assembling all these images, made these big prints and um, was completely seduced. So we, uh, we had a lunar landing party. We called it an Apollo 11 landing party on July 20th, 2019. And had a bunch of people come in, including a five engineer and uh, Eugene Worley uh, from Huntsville, Alabama, the man's, the, uh, uh, forget what the Huntsville Rocket Center is called, uh, which is bad memory maybe. <laughs> uh, and we had Morton Dean call in who had been an ABC and CBS correspondent for the space program. And we had a fellow come in who, uh, Dennis Wingo, who had been working on recovering the data from all of the lunar orbiter photographs. So it was just this whole mixture of people and we drank a toast to, Neil and Buzz and not forgetting Michael Collins in orbit. And uh, so it was, it was a great thing. We had the Apollo 11 movie going in one room. We had the mission 
law going in the other, in the classroom, and then we had uh, the toast in the gallery. So that was probably more than you wanted to know, David. But that gives you an idea of where where the whole thing came from. It, one of the things it does so clearly is it just bespeaks that my curiosity is insatiable. And I, I get curious about something and I can't resist going in deep, which is why with this national parks, not national parks, with this Golden Gate Park project, I'm going out and seeking all of these historical maps and graphics. And I've got seven or eight books now and I'm reading all of them and learning this very strange and highly politicized history of the creation of this uh, playland for urban San Francisco. And uh, then seeing that plan just sort of get taken over by nature and doing its own thing, it's becoming an interesting exploration of a human created landscape that has now become a nature transformed human creation. So anyway. <clears throat> Jeff is also asking, where is the project, National Parks Project at? Where is it at? Well, uh, it's had two different publishers, neither of which have worked out. Uh, the prints are still here. <laughs> the show is all printed. So it now requires me to have enough faith in the publishing world to go out and seek another publisher for it. The book has essentially been done since 2001. Yeah. But you know, you move on in life. And I thought I had a good publishing deal in 2006 as part of a two book deal. Uh, and then in 2007, they got cold feet. So uh, it's been hard to get back to and to keep going on the new things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those things that um, you're always going to be most fascinated by the newest thing that you're doing. But that doesn't mean you don't have great respect for the work, especially something that's hanging out there as a huge unfinished, or I shouldn't even say unfinished, unseen work. A lot of people saw the work, tens of thousands of people saw the work in its various previews but that's very different than seeing mm -hmm. it on a real tour and having the book done. So. so going off into the technical direction, Newler is asking if you ever use a polarizing filter. If I need to kill a reflection uh, off of a surface because I need to see through to what's underneath, yes. Uh, I, I would have to dig for it because I almost never <laughs> use it. Uh, but certainly not to enhance a uh, landscape because it makes them look very unnatural kills uh, for me what is the heart of photography magical light reflecting on yes things. so i really have no interest in polarizing filters except for that very narrow technical use mm. and you mentioned the canon 800 is that the new telescoping or trombone style or whatever they call it again uh in that case the 600 not the 800 uh, the 600 okay. uh, yeah you do have to uh, open it up and extend it out uh the, the great thing about it is it's relatively inexpensive, especially compared to their big, fast 600 or 800. Right. Uh, in addition to that, with the R5 that it mounts on, I can do a fairly high I.O. and uh, still have a reasonable image. I think those handheld full moon shots that I just made a week ago were at ISO 1600, which is normally higher than I would photograph for mm -hmm. things I was likely to be pleased with later. And if it hadn't been something on the move, like the moon, I should say the earth turning and the moon rotating, I would have taken the time to grab the tripod, I'm sure. But I didn't feel like I had those moments um, to spare. So it yeah. was literally handheld at a 16th of a second. The, the disadvantage is that it's a fixed aperture of f11, which means you don't get those sort of star, thing, uh, star patterns coming around the edge of the iris that can be fun sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but it means you you get a very different kind of lens flare that is actually prettier, I think. Yeah, and 800 but, bucks versus 33,000 or 4,000. Well, or 6,000. <laughs> or 6,000. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been yeah, a while since I looked at those I could, I could borrow the Canon equipment, but there was no way I could afford to buy one of those lenses. <laughs> um, and so it's been nice. It's, it's often too long for what I'm doing. So I end up, switching back and forth and this is kind of funny because it's these two extremes between the 24 to 105 and the 600 <laughs> which of course leaves a huge big gap of focal length uh out and so then I'll, I'll grab the canon 5 dsr with the 100 to 400 and between those two cameras and the lenses then i can pretty much take what i might call a casual stroll yeah it doesn't feel that casual <laughs> with all that stuff's running around your neck but 
You know, I, I was walking along one of my favorite places a few weeks ago, and all of a sudden there's a, a, a barn owl flying across the landscape. I've been going there for 20 years, never seen a barn owl. And although I wouldn't say I got a good photograph of it, mm -hmm. uh, I did get some photographs with that 600. And uh, you know, one of the things, John, about photography it allows you that leisure after the fact to look at what you couldn't see in the moment mm -hmm. something happened. And no, I didn't make a single good photograph of that barn owl. That, and I got yeah. to I got to hold on to that moment, moment. and look yes. at it. And just exactly. feel so <laughs> so privileged to be able to see it. So then for a couple of nights, I was going back every night. And the second night I went, I saw him again, got a slightly better photograph. <laughs> I haven't seen him since, although I've heard him off in the distance. But I think on the third night, then this red-tailed hawk comes out and sits right on a tree I have to walk past. <laughs> and by then I had both cameras, I had all sorts of options. <laughs> and I got this really nice portrait of this red tail that I am proud of in terms of- Yeah, it all people. comes together. It's, again, from, from Newler, what printer are you using these days? You know, more than anything else, I'm using the Canon Pro 1000. Uh, it could go up to the, it can go to 17 by 22, but for me, the 13 by 19 uh, size paper is what I use more than anything mm -hmm. else. When I'm going to uh, a larger print, it would either be uh, the Canon 4000, the 8400, or the HP uh, colored design jet 3400. Mm -hmm. And speaking of papers, you had a help in designing Hannah Mueller's museum etching, is that correct? I think I was the driving force behind its creation. Um, okay, that's my wife's yeah. favorite paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the paper. I'm so glad it's worked out so that they're still making it. Yeah, they had some nice, nice uh, rag-like papers, but they weren't cotton. They were uh, wood pulp, so they were not really acid-free. And uh, there was a real linting problem, and there was too much texture. So by then, by the, this is like 2003 or four. Mm -hmm. I had a pretty good relationship with Hanemula, and uh, I said, well, can we work on solving these problems and making 100% cotton paper and, and really construct them? And we went back and forth for about, I would guess, four or five months of different samples that they would send me, and I would try it out and talk about it and talk more about the attributes I was looking for. And when it came right down to it, Jörg Adamot, who was the president of Hanemula at the time, had a uh, said, okay, we're about ready to run tons of this stuff. Are you sure that people are going to want this, Steve? And suddenly I got all this nervousness inside of me, like, am, am I going to cause these people to run a lot of money without something anybody of me would like? But it's turned out that it is an absolutely beautiful paper, continues to be one of my two go-to papers uh, for everything I print. It's either that or their Hanamulus photo rag pearl kind of look. And those much and yeah, in a sense, when I think about the opportunities I've had, especially with the better light camera, to get a, a chance to photograph and do a whole project on the national parks with a camera, I had some influence on the evolution of its design. Mm -hmm. To get to print on a paper that I helped design, to get to work with printers like the the HP printers that I really did help design. It's like, come on, Steve, this can't be real. You're making this stuff up. But uh, it's been a privileged, it's been a really privileged career. What about printer inks? Uh, someone, Teresa is asking if you're familiar with John Cohn and the inks he makes, or are you all canon? Uh, I don't use anything other than the uh, printer manufacturer's inks. Uh, I know John and, and have a lot of respect for anybody that tries to pioneer things, but I trust the ink engine. HP a lot more than I do somebody who doesn't have that kind of salary and research budget. <laughs> when I when I worked uh, consulting with uh, HP on the development of their design jet printers, uh, mostly in Barcelona, but the ink groups were actually in San Diego and Vancouver, Washington. I got to know quite a bit about chromophores as color molecules, synthetic pigment uh, dyes, a real pigment in the rock like sense. And I came away with even more confidence that the inks that they're making have a lot more longevity in them. And that was pretty much borne out by Henry Wilhelm's tests and others. Mm -hmm. Who's inks? The manufacturers of the printers, Canon, HP, and Epson. They're pigment inks at least. Yeah, so Jeff is asking, is better light still working? 
the better light camera still works. Mike pretty much shut down the company a couple of years before he passed away. And uh, there is uh, still a better light forum and a better light uh, group of people that stay together. They're actually contracting with a programmer to write updates to the scanning back software. Mm -hmm. So it still exists as a group of dedicated owners and it's still the highest resolution art capping camera most people are likely to have access to other than the, the, you know, the scanning stage cameras that can move around over a piece of artwork. So uh, it's still out there in a lot of museums and that's frankly where most of the cameras mm -hmm. were sold anyway. Yeah, Therese is also asking if Epson or Canon are ever gonna move to a refillable cartridge system. Never. <laughs> uh, I think both Canon and Epson have refillable cartridges uh, that they now sell. Uh, I think it seems to be on the four color bottles. printers. Yeah, they're bottles of ink rather than the cartridges that you would refill. Uh, the paper name that we were mentioned is Hanamule um, Museum Etching. Sandy was asking in the chat. Yeah, and the photo rag pearl is the other one I use. Now, there's something that we should always mention about papers and that's optical brightening agents, uh, OBAs. Optical brighteners are basically UV glowing agents that make a blue or white out of the paper than is naturally part of the paper fiber. And of course they fade over time. So you end up with a more yellowish natural color to the paper, but it's actually turned out that those OBAs, those optical brightening agents are affecting the longevity of the pigments themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're double, they're double bad. Double whammy. And, uh, so you should make sure any printing paper you choose uh, doesn't have uh, optical brightening agents in them. Yeah. And uh, Hanumula doesn't make as big a deal about declaring that as some companies do, but you can find out which papers have it and which papers don't. Cool. So other folks in the audience have any questions or comments that they want to bring up? Uh, I know Jeff says some things he wanted to say or show. If I can. Um, yes. Yeah, so is, is your aerial photography happenstance or is that something you plan and if so, uh, what do you plan and how do you do it? Well, the aerial photography over the last 40 years is because I had some justification for renting the aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there had to be some reason I was spending that kind of money because I'm a, I'm a working artist here. The, the amount of funds available are always pretty limited and have to be carefully spent. So the, the, that photograph of Golden Gate Park I showed earlier on was when I got the pre-release version of the Canon 5DSR, one of the things that I, I missed about the other digital cameras, 35 millimeter format kinds of cameras that I'd used is the resolution I wanted to be able to capture. And so the first thing I did with that prototype camera is I did go ahead and spend the money on renting uh, an aircraft to fly me. And in that case, you know, if you're flying out of the Half Moon Bay Airport, I'm going to take a run up the coast along San Francisco. I'm going to fly up to Point Reyes, back around the Golden Gate Bridge over the city. And I did all of that that day and got, uh, ended up making photographs that I was not only astounded by the view and being able to hold, but ultimately determined that the camera was actually quite a handsome camera for aerial photography. So uh, nowadays, of course, uh, I would start with a drone uh, and decide if I needed more altitude than that. And the interesting thing about the drone, of course, is it's providing that intermediate view between uh, your six foot ground level, five and a half feet, whatever it happens to be, and 400 feet that gives you most of what you would want in terms of abstraction and design and that aerial perspective, as opposed to the expense of hauling yourself up in an actual aircraft to ride along but I love to fly, so I love area photography and uh, it's a part of what I've always done and will continue to do. I am trying to talk myself out of spending money on a new drone, of course, because they've got fancier ones now than when I bought mine four or five years ago. But um, so far, I've, the, the, the drone photography I've been doing lately has been just to get my feet wet again and then get some things from outside mm -hmm. of Golden Gate Park looking in. What camera do you use on the drone? Uh, I have a, a Phantom 4 from DJI, and I'm mm -hmm. certainly looking at the Hasselblad camera on the new DJI Mavic, but I uh, haven't talked myself into buying another <laughs> piece of equi equipment. I'm finding that during the pandemic, especially, it's very important to be careful of what you spend. Yes. 
Are you still an explorer of life? Yes, yes. And still very grateful for being so and uh, feel like the relationship with Canon is, um, you know, it, it's all over the place if you really count the whole years. But for years with Stephen Lima, the program uh, really ran in a way that uh, worked well for me. And uh, it's been working well for me again these last couple of years. So uh, yeah, still working with them and very pleased. And, and again, they put no pressure on me to do anything other than what I want to do, which is good. And um, they'll still sponsor talks, even virtual talks now. Of course, over the years, as I look back on income, about a third has been from lectures and some part of that has been Canon funded lectures. And then about a third has been from print sales and about a third have been from my own workshops. So, so are you doing online tutorials or anything during the pandemic classes? Do you yes. Yeah, we started doing the first online classes back in the late spring, early summer. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've got, just to plug it, I've got a fine yeah. art digital printing class coming up this weekend, the 6th and 7th. Yeah, if you want to throw and a I, link to that in the chat, feel free well, to. Well, that would mean I would uh, probably <laughs> not pay attention to what I'm saying, but I'll see if I can do that. Well, that'll, give, yeah. that'll give Jeff a chance to come in and say some things. <laughs> Always <laughs> fine. Can I just uh, and ask a follow-up yes, question that just occurred to me? Do you, um, when you fly, do you fly yourself and shoot or do you get another pilot? No, I, I, I'm not a pilot, so I can't do that. Looks like Jeff is throwing some photographs of a very <laughs> old looking fellow. I'm not sure he, he found this old codger, but uh, younger than I am now. <laughs> that looks like an Antarctica image. Yeah. Yep, Jeff there we go. To, uh, that's, Jeff and so, I have been to Antarctica three times together. Yes, and the interesting thing about uh, the trip to Antarctica, um, there's a whole lot of waiting and a whole lot of carrying of equipment. Our first trip down, we get down there and the airline goes on strike and uh, Michael Reichman uh, and Chris Anderson try to figure out how the hell to get us from Buenos Aires down to Ishwaya, which is where the ship came out of. Um, and then one of the things, of course, when we travel, there's Steve taking a nap. I, I, mm -hmm. I have a lot of pictures of Steve napping. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we had, a, we had our own 747. It was quite yes, an amazing we did, thing. On that first trip down. And then yeah. here we are dragging our stuff, including the wine. You see the bags of wine okay. that was uh, organized by Seth. And then Michael Reichman, bless his heart, brought us down to teach and the shoot. And uh, um, this is kind of what it looked like uh, one day out from Ishwaya going through the um, uh, uh, Drake Passage. They call it the Drake Lake or the Drake Rock and Roll. And we had rock and roll. Well, you may notice, Jeff, that Anthony Hobbs is also online here, who was yes. on one of those trips. I've got pictures of Anthony. Yeah, there you are. This was the ship for the first trip, um, and it was a, a converted uh, Russian research vessel, AKA a, a, spy ship. Yeah, re, a research <laughs> vessel, yes. Uh, and then this is uh, Stephen, there's uh, uh, Anthony. Stephen brought his own Sherpa because he had all that <laughs> shit that he had to carry. No, uh, no, 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 you can't say it like that, Jeff. I had the wonderful assistance of a great friend of mine who was willing to help me carry some of my stuff around. Yeah, well, <laughs> your Anthony Sherpa. could never be called a Sherpa. No, 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 no. He was out there photographing. Actually, that would be a porter. The Sherpa yeah. are higher level people. And there's Seth and JP uh, and Michael and the, the um, Ian, um, God, I can't remember Ian's last name. He's Irish. Um, <laughs> Uh, we were there with uh, Bill Atkinson. Bill was an interesting character. And then Still the, is an interesting character. <laughs> there's off looking. The interest, and then um, the one thing that's weird about all the stuff, uh, this was the trip that we took, just the instructors. Uh, and this was February 19th, 2007. And the reason I know is that that's when Lightroom 1.0 actually shipped. So we did a little video on that. It was just before your birthday. Yeah. 
And then um, this is what our crews um, uh, looked like in terms of everybody with, I don't know what the hell they were shooting. I think they were shooting me because <laughs> I'm so interesting. <laughs> Jeff, um, let's not make it let's not make it too much about the antarctica trips though. yeah no, uh, kevin but, rabers is always asking if the ship is still doing tours he heard it's being remodeled and overhauled yeah don't know um one of these might be steven although <laughs> we all just look like big yellow penguins mm -hmm. uh and then this was the first time i i uh the shot that i think steven took um there's steven setting up with yeah. uh anthony yeah. With with the yeah with the better light, mm -hmm. Stephen. Whenever he would set up, he would always draw a. <laughs> and this was not a quick thing to shoot, <laughs> right, Stephen? No, it, it took uh, well, especially the panoramics could take better part of ten minutes, depending on yes. how much light was present. How does the but, battery life in the cold? Uh, oh, it worked out okay. okay. You know, yeah. by the. It, it wasn't that cold for the most part. It's colder in Chicago, as we told you. Wow. He put the battery in his armpit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, the, it was down in the pack. But uh, the. But he, you rigged this little thing so you could hold a laptop. Um, talk about high maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you see, in that case, it's got the panoramic adapter that was designed by Howard Barney in Portland, Oregon, who ran, who created the first Barney scan back in the late 1980s. And that oh, thing could yeah. go 360, six, right? And, yeah, well, it could be even 400. Howard Barney was the first one to ship a version of Photoshop that he called- Right, it was Barney called Barney Scan. Scan. Right. X, Barney Scan XP. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is my favorite so, shot of him, uh, Stephen, down in Antarctica. Uh, well, the Jeff, three I, don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of these, so you've got to send them on to Oh, me. I will send them to you. <laughs> okay. uh, we were also uh, down there with uh, Thomas Noel. Um, and you know we would always work on Thomas uh, about features, and I, Stephen had a lot to do <clears throat> with Photoshop, particularly early on with color management and quad tone curves and and all kinds of uh, uh, involvement. And and then of course Stephen carried his little uh, color checker card and let everybody take photos of his color checker. And one of the problems is this is color balanced off of the color checker. One of the problems was white balance down there was just very, very difficult because if you it neutralized it, everything was like too blue. Plus, uh, we've also got the, the added problem, and this is a constant problem. Our brain and I are constantly adapting to our environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we will, we will shift our perception of color vision and what looks the world looks like to us, depending on how long we've been in a particular ambient light and the nature of that ambient light. And the color checker will give you a spectrally neutral rendering, which may or may not look like you, what you saw. Yeah. So you always have to take into a human- Sure, correct color is not always light. pleasing color. Well, I'm not yeah, even talking you. about that. I'm talking about your vision, your mm -hmm. psycho-optical adaptation is different than a spectrophotometer will measure. Yeah. And so that's cool. why looking at the image in a contemporary time frame to when you made it, really helps you dial out some of the weirdness that even a color checker will help you achieve, hmm. not by intent to be weird, just by the fact that it takes it back to a neutral rendition and you have not yet fully adapted to make things neutral. You may in Antarctica still be seeing a lot of blue, even though your mind has subtracted a lot of that blue out and you need to find some middle ground between a spectrally neutral warmer version that is often the case in softer bluer light and the real vivid electric blue that six months after people made a photograph they'll swear is exactly what it looked like. It so saying so really saying well. all that Stephen you do alter the image I certainly control the raw processing based on your vision based on what I remember that what I saw in the most contemporary time I can Okay. Everything right. is an interpretation. Let, let, me, let, let me finish that thought. The raw photograph is not a photograph in any literal sense of the word. It doesn't become a photograph, an interpretation on it. And so when people say things like, oh, I just do mine straight. Well, you're not doing it straight. You're doing it according to whatever the raw processor, either as a JPEG processor inside the camera 
or the default processor defaults uh, in the raw processing software. To not intervene is to assume that that is the correct processing, and it's not. More often than not, it's going to be way too contrasty, way too saturated, and have nuances of color balance that are just simply wrong. I just want to ask so three. A, I want to ask three questions. Oh, oh, Michael, hold on one second. Hold no, on no. Second. I was ready for you asking questions, so I brought a book. So go ahead. <laughs> three, qu three questions, real quick, as quick as I'm you just can come stop up the with share the, for a moment. A, a, a cup, why? Uh, as quickly as you can come up with the answer. What color is an apple? What color is the sky? And what color is the grass on the ground? Varies with the grass, varies with the apple, and I didn't hear what the middle one was. The grit, the apple is what color? It depends on the apple. What color is the sky? Cyan. <laughs> what color is the what color is the grass on the ground? Well, are you wanting me to answer? Or is this a free for all? No, go ahead, you answer. <laughs> uh, if you're asking about the sky, uh, I have to take a moment to talk about the way raw processors tend to make skies too royal blue. So you really need to look at the hue of the blue slider to try and get that slightly more cyanish tint the skies actually are because I've never seen a raw processor that didn't misinterpret the sky. So in other words, so, that, that, that moon shot that you took, the black of the sky really should have been cyan blue? But you're talking about the black and white interpretation? No, when, I, when, when anybody takes a picture of, 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 of the moon using a digital camera, it's processing it in an RGB, all right? So I'm taking a picture of the sky. So the answer to the question is a sky can be white, a sky can be black, a sky can be cyan, a sky can be yellow. And well, the you grass... can answer your own questions, which is fine, but if you're asking me. Yes, I, yes that, that's, that's, <laughs> why, that's, why I asked, that's why I asked the question to come back to some, something that's normal. The reality is that the grass on the ground, if you come from Kentucky, what color is grass? Blue. It's going to be more bluish, you would say. A and if you come blue. from the Bronx and, you, and, you, and, and, and it's the middle of the summer, what color is the grass? There is none. Yes, it is. <laughs> Michael, it's brown. What's your, what, it's brown. Why don't you get to why don't you get to your point? The point what, is, what are you that, is that everything, most of what you just said about color and and the, the the look of the color ultimately depends basically on your post interpretation of what you actually saw. Because there is no such thing. At, wait, 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 if no you're talking about the if you're talking about the delicacy of uh, the fog or the delicacy of uh, subtle colors on the side of uh, the Grand Canyon, all right, uh, you won't remember that by the time you get back. So it becomes your interpretation of it. So in a sense- Well, I would beg to, I would beg her to differ with you right there. That's okay. why I go to the trouble of looking at the photographs while I'm still in the field and my color memory which is really quite good, is still fresh in my mind. So if the raw interpreter is leading me down a path of misinterpretation, I can see it real quick and try and tune it to what I saw. But if you it's take certainly that true that, that, that a photograph, if you're trying to imitate what you saw, has to go through your literal optical mental adaptation that you were at at that point. It requires interpretation for sure. It's not a scientific instrument because that wouldn't even give you what you saw. But if you're trying to be faithful and that is your goal and you're somewhat skilled at being faithful, then you can go a long path toward that color being very reminiscent of what you saw. And that is certainly the, my goal. But the problem with your color memory is your interpretation of the color of the subject you're seeing is also dependent upon the surround around that color. Which is why you don't want colorful screens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, backgrounds on your computer. No, 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 no. I, I well, mean, uh, I mean the subject you're photographing. You could be photographing something and see it, but if you're photographing something that's yellow and the surround is grass, your your interpretation of that yellow is going to be affected by the green or blue of the grass. It may well be, and so the the, the thing again is to try and hook back into what you were seeing and understanding to be the scene when you made the photograph, because that ultimately is the motivation for making the photograph. 
because you've seen something that you're interested in trying to hold. And given that, that's the criteria I use. I can't make a case for truth beyond any doubt. I can make a case for photography being an extraordinarily truthful medium if you choose to use it that way. And that does assume good on the part of the photographer. And then it's a matter of what you want out of the image. If you want to replicate your visual experience of having seen wonder, which is what my goal is, then you've got a different set of criteria than if you're using the, the pixels as some sort of raw source for whatever happens to come to mind and you turn it more into what I call a pixel graph than a photograph. You know, if that's, you were to... that's all well and good because it's again, a matter of what you want out of your photography. Michael, you... shut up for a second. Let me talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things that was the most interesting when Seth and JP and I, we were going down to Antarctica and um, um, Michael Reichman had said that he was putting John Paul Caponegro uh, was bunking with Stephen Johnson and, and Seth and I were looking at each other and it's like, oh my God. Mr. No manipulation with Mr. Everything is manipulated. Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, JP and Stephen got along fine because when they first started talking, JP <laughs> said that Stephen said, well, I don't really think of you as a photographer. I think of you as a painter <laughs> or something to those effects. I, I remember the conversation. It wasn't exactly those words, but that was the general idea of it. Yeah, yeah, I remember but, uh, John Paul came to see me in 1996 or seven with Alexandra. So I'd known him for years yeah. before uh, those Antarctica trips. So we've been friends but for a long time. The other thing that I was gonna point out is that when you look at a photographer's images, their basic um, credibility and their dedication to their craft, if you look at a Stephen Johnson image, you can, you can be assured that it's not highly manipulated. It's, it, it's a fair representation of what Stephen saw or thought he saw, uh, and whether it's color or black and white. Now, one of the things that Stephen did that was interesting was false color infrared. You didn't show any of those, uh, yeah. but you know that's uh, an, uh, an accurate rendering of the scene given the technology. That's what we're really talking about. Now, yeah, when, you take, when you take the <laughs> sensors from each one of the major manufacturers, the Nikon, well, the Nikon, Sony, uh, uh, Canon, mm. Hasselblad, all right, each one of those sensors is set up based on their own individual engineers' interpretation of how they want those sensors to, to, uh, to appear in the raw in the raw file now those are two separate pieces the raw interpreter and the sensor construction it doesn't matter it's different, it's different, different even, even, it doesn't matter a sony we're getting a lost sony, in the weeds here a I sony, a sony, yeah, sony sensor a sony time. sensor is not going to give you the same kind of look as a canon sensor yeah and but the photographer, but the photographer we're, gives the photographer's look of the photograph regardless of the sensor that produced it. So I think they, in this particular circumstance, one quick point, yeah. if I shoot a photograph of a banana, when, the, when I'm looking at the image, I want it to match what I think I saw, That's right. regardless of anything else. I'm not gonna go back and try to make that banana the, the exact digital uh, uh, interpretation of yellow. So regardless of how it came about, you, the photographer, in this case, Stephen Johnson, is saying, this is what I saw, this is how I interpreted it, this is how I'm printing it, and it doesn't make any difference what it came from. So I think, I think that's the point uh, more than anything else. Quick question, uh, <laughs> do you find yourself kind of chasing a look in film, um, a look that you might have gotten in film a little bit more directly? Um, or how did you, how would you compare shooting now digitally as compared to how you shot on film? Well, I think that the, uh, the film era when I switched to color negatives started giving me a window into a world of pastel lighting that, as I said earlier, I was really seduced by. Seeing all this heavy handed saturation, of course, it's only gotten worse 
with Photoshop, uh, made me go in the opposite direction of sensing that they were not seeing the same world I was seeing. They were seeing this artificial, souped up, heavy duty world. And I'm talking about the late 1970s, not about the 2020s where you could say it's even worse. So film gave me that window in with color negatives because I had more control over the exposure, color balance and density. But ultimately, um, I'm not trying to chase any film style. I'm trying to chase my natural experience of the real world. And where I have greater advantage with a particular technology, and digital has certainly given me that, to see more clearly, more accurately, more faithfully, then I'm deeply interested in that. And so it's, you know, you, you can't talk about any photographic process that isn't an interpretation. It clearly is, if nothing else, from three-dimensional reality to two-dimensional graphic design. But with regards to color, I'm so fascinated about it, by it and so in love with the color that I see that I pay a great deal of attention toward trying to get the photographs to be what I saw. And for the most part, I can do that before I even leave the raw processor. And then when there's color crossover from highlight to shadows, and there's, for instance, more blue in the shadows than I saw with my eyes, that may be something that's better handled in Photoshop instead of the raw processor. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. So, yeah, let's, let's, not, a lot of fun let's, today. Go, let's not go too far into the weeds on, on the uh, difference in sensors. Yeah, because it's, it's, what I wanted to say about that, I've used a variety of digital cameras over the years, and the work looks consistent throughout because it's my eye and my color judgment that is driving the editing of the photographs from the raw data into the image that I'm interested in trying to share with you. So do you have any other final words for us, Stephen? Well, I guess I could say that uh, not too much different than I started off with. Photography has given me, and probably many of you, a contact with the earth that I would not have had otherwise. It's given me this grand excuse to be out in the world. It's given me a vehicle to give back to that natural world through my efforts with conservation organizations and campaigns. And at the same time, it's given me the incentive, leisure and sensitivity to notice this complex nuanced earth that has only become ever more precious through all these years of trying to photograph it. And so photography has been this gift of life to me, this gift of appreciating the real world. And that's why that, that veracity, that faithfulness is so important to me because I have no interest personally in making photographs that are derivative any more than the process has to be. I have a great deal of interest in trying to show, to hold what I saw that was so wonderful and then trying to share that wonder with others. And then in the teaching, try to empower other people to be able to hold on to those things themselves and find their own voice, whatever that happens to be. I did go ahead and post that uh, printing workshop. Yes, we saw that week. in there. And I'll put that in the link, that link in the, the other YouTube. Thing, the other thing I wanted to say is John and I were talking about this earlier with his photo conversations. I've also been doing a photo chat of just some photography friends every Tuesday morning. And if anybody wants to be a part of that, it's sometimes presentation, it's sometimes just encouragement, it's sometimes critiques. Just drop me a line and you'll be invited. And there's great. Obviously yeah, the more we get together, I mean, this is the way to get together and keep the friendships going and seeing some people that I haven't seen in years. So yeah. And Jeff, I really appreciate you digging out those photographs from Antarctica and sharing some of the stories and continue to appreciate your faith in me. I, uh, it's all well, nice. I'll send you uh, I'll send you the Lightroom file uh, catalog with uh, the images. The one that I was looking for was the one the when you and I went to uh, the Badlands of South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Uh, I rode my motorcycle out while Stephen was out there shooting, and uh, I ended up doing a portrait of him that ended up in Life Magazine. Yeah, Life Magazine, December. Yeah, the only picture I've ever had in Life Magazine is of Stephen Johnson. Did you uh, but find the it? bizarre thing is we're out there at sunrise shooting in uh, Death, I mean, in the Badlands of South Dakota, and he turns on, well, he had NPR on the radio, and he, and he turns on the radio and we're driving along at sunrise in, in uh, the Badlands 
and an interview with Stephen comes on the radio. And I mean, it was just the most bizarre experience that I can remember was hearing Stephen talk on the radio and then hearing Stephen talk about himself talking on the radio. And yeah, it was an out of body experience. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. <laughs> Uh, but I th thank you very much, Stephen and, and uh, Anthony. I, I I called you a Sherpa because, uh, well, that's what you <laughs> called yourself, I think, <laughs> at one point. Cool. I'm going to close the Facebook right now. Stop well, that thanks, live John. Stream. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate seeing all these old friends, long-term friends, not necessarily yes. old. <laughs> and it, it, really, it really builds that sense of community that makes all of this stuff so terribly precious. Thank you, John. Thank you.